it keeps the soil in place and, and keeps the nutrients out of the, out of the creek and out of the river and out of the ocean. In Iowa and Illinois, there is something new down on the farm. New ways to keep the land fertile and the water clean. But in Arkansas, an industrial hog farm threatens the beauty of a beloved river. That is a lot of waste. This is untreated sewage. They kept us alive. The food, you know, clothing, shelter, lodges. We couldn't have survived without them. Now that they need us, we need to step up for them. Protecting the majestic bison, once the center of the universe for Native Americans. So grab a paddle and plunge right in. This American Land starts now. <laughs> Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation. Hi, and welcome to This American Land. I'm Ed Arnett, and we've got some great stories for you today about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes and waters, wildlife, and the people that make conservation work for all of us. Today we start in Arkansas, where a new industrial hog farm has been built near the Buffalo National River, raising alarm among local residents who see the farm as a source of pollution and a serious threat to the river. The Buffalo National River in Arkansas. 140 miles of clean water protected by an act of Congress. This place was so important that Congress came up with a new designation, a national river, and named this America's first national river in the 70s. But this was our first recognition that water and waterways were so valuable and so important that they should be protected in perpetuity. But now there's a new threat to this river. A huge industrial hog farm, similar to this one, has been built about six miles away, near the town of Mount Judy. 6,500 pigs, tightly packed into cages, producing tons of hog waste, more than two million gallons a year. Basically, they can put out enough waste that, you know, is equivalent to a city of about 35,000 people. That is a lot of waste. This is untreated sewage. The waste is flushed into holding ponds, then sprayed over 600 acres of hayfields next to Big Creek, which flows downstream into the Buffalo National River, raising alarm among those who know the porous geology of this area. The Ozarks are, are typified by springs, by emerging streams and disappearing streams and sinkholes and caves, uh, all of which are openings and crevices in the limestone substrata. When a contaminant is placed on the topsoil, as it percolates down through that topsoil, it hits that limestone layer and then follows all of those cracks and crevices and pores until it hits water. Many of those fields are immediately adjacent to Big Creek, which flows six miles downstream into the Buffalo. We are very concerned about the potential for pollution. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the hog waste pollution will reach the Buffalo River. All right, here we go. This dye tracing test allows us to evaluate flow directions underground. Most of the water goes underground and we can't see it. So we see water coming out from springs all around here, but we don't know what's the contributing area to those springs. This well will allow us to, to see where the water on the field is infiltrating, where it's getting into the system, where it ends up, especially where it, it ends up. We've collected data that shows the water is going into this creek, one of the two largest contributors to the flow in the Buffalo River. The CNH factory farm is classified as a confined animal feeding operation, like this one in North Carolina. And it's nothing like a traditional pig farm. It is owned and operated by local people, but the hogs are owned by the Cargill Corporation, a giant multinational that contracts with industrial farms like this to feed and raise animals for processing. 
the contract with Cargill and a nearly $4 million taxpayer subsidized loan made the operation possible on land that was purchased for it, taking many local residents by surprise. What sort of galvanized public opinion in the first place was the lack of, of local notification about the facility. By the time we found out about it, the facility was almost completed. The factory farm was approved by state authorities and the Federal Farm Services Administration, but without any prior consultation with the National Park Service, which manages the Buffalo National River. The Park Service are the stewards of this land. It is their job to protect that land. Their stewardship was circumvented when they were not allowed to weigh in and comment on what the impacts of this farm would have on the water. The Farm Services Administration had carried out its own environmental assessment of the factory farm. We take great issue with even calling it an environmental assessment. It's, it's so weak and so full of holes and so inadequate. The National Park Service agreed and filed a long list of objections to the assessment citing probable violations of federal environmental laws. There's also concern in Mount Judy that the hog farm's close proximity to a public school creates a health hazard to students and teachers. Public health is threatened by the large number of microorganisms that exist in hogs, whether feral or domestic. And uh, those include E. coli, the owners of the CNH farm did not respond to requests for interviews for this report. They have said that their operation meets all legal requirements. Cargill has stated it will continue to support the factory farm, but that it will not expand it or build more hog facilities in the Buffalo River watershed. It has also committed to installing new technologies to manage the waste. And there are those in this small community who support the owners of the factory farm. Most of the people that come into the cafe or that I've talked to locally are for CNH Hog Farms. I don't have any issue with it at all. I don't necessarily think that they did anything as far as trying to be misleading. But there is still widespread opposition to the factory farm in this county which relies on the Buffalo National River to attract tourists and revenue, creating thousands of jobs. We're one of the poorest and lowest populated counties in, in Arkansas, and tourism plays a huge part in our local industry here. One of the biggest qualities of the Buffalo National River that attracts people is the pristine quality of the, of the ecosystem here. It's unspoiled, it's clean, people can swim in it without fear of getting sick and I think if we were to all of a sudden discover that there were elevated uh, E. coli readings then it would have a chilling effect on tourism and on our on our county and on the entire Buffalo River. There's every possibility that the National Park Service could very well shut down certain sections of the river because of pollution. The owners of the farm and Cargill say there is no cause for concern about pollution. But for many people in this county and across the nation, that assurance is not enough. This is not just an Arkansas issue. Buffalo National River belongs to the United States of America. It belongs to my grandchildren, your grandchildren, your great, great, great grandchildren. We owe it to the future generations to protect these places and to say that there are some places that are sacred and that are not for sale. Our next story is from the farmlands of Illinois and Iowa, bordering the Mississippi River, where farmers are adopting new methods of controlling runoff from their lands to prevent pollution of the Mississippi watershed.
Hey Brian, it's Joe. Just wanted to give you a heads up. We're um, leaving the office now. I uh, should be out there in about 15 or 20 minutes. This morning we're on our way out to see a local farmer. Get up there! Brian Parkinson, who's also one of our Soil and Water Conservation District Directors. Brian's land that he operates is located in two watersheds. Mill Creek watershed goes to the Rock River and then to the Mississippi. And the other part of his farm goes to the Coppers Creek watershed, which directly enters the Mississippi River. Our country has been blessed in that we've never had famines. And a part of our stability as a country is a stable food supply. There we go. When I started farming this farm back in 1987, I basically bought all my dad's equipment, which included the full line of tillage equipment and big tractors and everything. And at about that time, there was a program to meet a certain goal of minimizing erosion by the year 2000, I think it was. It became obvious to me that we were being encouraged to do something called no-till. And the only experience I had with no-till up until that point had been, it looked like to me, disastrous. I'd seen some people try it here and there, and uh, it always looked like to me like it was a terrible thing to do. Well, we tried it the next year, a uh, 40-acre field of soybeans, and um, it turned out to be a, a wonderful program. Those beans were just as good, if not better, than any beans I had on the farm that year. Uh, much less input, didn't have to go out and prepare the soil at all, just planted right into the old corn stalks. And I became like an overnight convert to no-till. Within a year, I had sold all my tillage equipment and had a no-till planter and uh, proceeded to farm every year that way. Uh, up until present. No-till is a, a system of planting corn and soybeans where the tillage is performed by a planter or a drill in one pass. If you were to rake through there with a subsoiler or a tillage or a chisel plow or something like that, you'd wreck all that soil structure that you work so hard to, to build up and the earthworms. If you were to go bury that residue, well, you basically are starving your earthworm population. And they're my little mini farmers out there. It keeps the soil in place and, and keeps the nutrients out of the, out of the creek and out of the river and out of the ocean. Uh, we're going to go down and take a look at a new practice that's uh, called a saturated buffer. The idea of the saturated buffer strip is to intercept the water that's carrying nutrients that come from the fields and allow it to be taken up by the prairie grass that we planted in the saturated buffer strip before it hits the creek. So we're trying to stop the problem here in my field before it ever becomes a problem for somebody else downstream. My name is John Matz and I'm a district conservationist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Cedar and Muscatine counties in Iowa. I fish, uh, I duck hunt a little bit, and so to me I don't want to see uh, the river degraded or, or abused. And so it, it's important that farmers and, and other land users in the Mississippi watershed uh, are able to uh, treat it right and, and be responsible with, with their nutrients. And then I think uh, David and Amy are a perfect example. When I graduated from college, I didn't see myself doing this. But along with Amy, my wife, a couple of college degrees, a lot of uh, naive determination, we, we've done it. And, it, and it's been good. Welcome to Majestic Manor Dairy. We're located halfway between Davenport and Muscatine, Iowa. We actually have our application in for 150 years in the same family, so our Heritage Farm application went in this year. And it has gone from mother to daughter for four generations. We have had an excellent opportunity to partner with the NRCS here at our dairy operation. We've got 175 head of cattle up on top of the hill that becomes the confluence of two major water drainage areas in our neighborhood. It is our responsibility on this farm to maintain two well-designed waterway systems that bring that water in from the south and from the east. So we have a direct impact on water quality to the Mississippi River. We have a um, liquid manure storage structure that contains approximately a half million gallons of storage. 
uh, in which we store dairy liquid manure solids in a liquid form. That manure is injected into the fields for uh, crop nutrients. That was a really nice project to get completed with NRCS assistance. And that was also through the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, or EQIP. So financial assistance was provided to help uh, offset the cost of the structure underneath those slats. So those, uh, the slats were to allow the manure to go through and then the concrete pit underneath then stored uh, the manure until he was able to land apply it. He doesn't want to see that go into that waterway and down into the creek because we know eventually it will get to the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf where it has just disastrous uh, consequences. My name is Steve Kouser. We're located in Bradford, Illinois. We have a hog operation of 2,200 sows. I'm Erica Turner. I'm the district conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service here in Bureau County. Well, I've uh, been involved with the NRCS for probably 30 years. I can remember when we first started learning about soil conservation and the importance of uh, protecting our water sources. Yeah. We changed our farming methods to more of a conservation tillage in some cases, and in some cases no tillage at all, to uh, be able to stop erosion or reduce erosion to the point where the land would replenish itself with what was lost each year. This site has a lagoon for effluent storage that was in compliance with runoff issues and protecting the streams. One of the goals was to help eliminate odor from the lagoon. So we have three rows of trees that'll help take some of that odor so that it doesn't keep continuing across the landscape and to its neighbors. Another area that we really became involved with uh, NRCS in was the disposal of the dead and euthanized animals. And NRCS directed us toward a composting which is uh, thought of now in the industry as a best management practice. Well, this is the uh, in-vessel composting machine. It takes about two weeks for the process to complete and come out the other end. And then it can be applied to the fields. This is the material as it exits the composter. It's really kind of a neat thing in a way to be able to uh, grow corn and feed it to the pigs and use the waste from the animals to fertilize the soil and to grow corn. It's a win for us because then we get to see soil being preserved and water quality being protected, which is ultimately what our goals are. It's a rewarding thing that you can see that the work that you do on a daily basis has an effect on the landscape in a positive way. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm helping a person with a problem. And if I'm helping them, I'm doing our mission, NRCS's mission, that's helping people help the land. Now we go west to Yellowstone National Park, where the herds of American bison are growing beyond the park's capacity. There's now a campaign and legal battle to find new homes for them on Native American reservations and restore them to parts of their historic habitat on the Northern Plains. This report, with Earth Justice, looks at the progress of that campaign and the outlook for America's iconic wild buffalo. In the spring of 2012, a very historic event occurred in the campaign for bison conservation. Wild buffalo calves were born on the Fort Peck Reservation in northern Montana on the Great Plains. I'm Tim Presso. I'm managing attorney of the Northern Rockies Office of Earth Justice. Approximately 60 of the last wild bison were moved from the Yellowstone Park region up to northeastern Montana, out onto the Great Plains, where bison formerly roamed, onto the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. Livestock interests have sued to stop any further such bison relocations, and specifically to prevent the Fort Peck bison from being shared with other Native American tribes on the Fort Belknap Reservation, which is another Indian reservation in northern Montana that is eager to have wild bison on its landscape. You know, I come to identify uh, 
eat the naan or buffalo or bison as an integral part of who we are, where we came from. The, you know, they, they kept us alive. The food, you know, clothing, shelter, lodges. Place here would, would work for them, would work for us. We just have to, you know, figure out the, uh, the way to help each other. When you have a people that have a history like our people have with these magnificent animals, their absence has been felt by our people. And now that they're back, our people are more centered. The unit that we have built up now for them is now that they'll reside on 7,200 acres, which basically goes way over the hills and goes into another unit that will add on another four more miles. These animals were the center of our universe. They were so important to us that we regarded them as family. We couldn't have survived without them. Now that they need us, we need to step up for them. There's been over 6,000 of them killed over the last couple decades. Yellowstone Park is a big place, and it ha provides habitat for many bison. But it doesn't provide enough habitat for the bison herd to occupy perpetually because the bison herd continues to reproduce year after year. And eventually, they overflow the park's boundaries. In the past, the answer to that was slaughter. When the bison moved outside the park, they were captured and slaughtered just like livestock at a feedlot. The reason all this is going on is because ranchers claim that the bison could infect their cattle with a disease called brucellosis. Today, the last places where brucellosis still exists in the wild is Yellowstone, where the bison and the elk, uh, some of them have infection of brucellosis. The curious thing about the way bison are treated is that while both bison and elk uh, have the potential to transmit brucellosis to other wildlife and to cattle, elk get a free pass. <laughs> the bison have been subject to a policy on the north boundary that says no when they try to move across the park boundary and subjects them to hazing, capture, testing for brucellosis, shipment to slaughter. Well, the issue is when they get in the state of Montana, they're actually illegal. Wild bison are illegal in the state of Montana. So they come wandering out looking for food on the year when it's, when it's snowy and deep snow up in the park. And they cross this political boundary, the park boundary, and, and then they're in trouble out here. These are the descendants of the last wild bison that survived the slaughters of the 19th century, and we don't want to see them being slaughtered in the 21st century. Now we're recognizing that there's such a precious genetic resource and a precious link to our natural history past that there's an opportunity to, to use that overflow, so to speak, as uh, the seed stock for return of wild bison to their natural habitats in appropriate places across the West and the Great Plains. Yellowstone was the last haven for wild buffalo in the late 19th century when we reduced them from estimated 30 million down to the last 25 wild individuals, and those were the last 25 in Yellowstone National Park. Now today, we're in the, the fortunate position that uh, our natural heritage includes the descendants of those last wild bison. A lot of people practice law, but very few get to stand up in court and make an argument on behalf of these magnificent wildlife species that we still have, the grizzly bear, the wolf, the elk, and of course the bison. We're not going anywhere. This campaign will continue and we will be there at every step of the way to make sure that the bison is a living, breathing part of the Montana landscape. Now here's a quick look at a story from our next show. They're being exposed every day to a witch's brew of toxins. There's a long, long list of health problems that result. Decades of pesticide poisoning in central Florida, terrible pollution, and forgotten farm workers. We'd be in the field and have a plane spraying, and they spray that stuff right on top of us. As a farm worker, you didn't have a voice. You couldn't talk, you couldn't 
speak your piece, you can speak your mind. Because if you make too much noise, you're out of a job. Some ancient agriculture practices are paying off in a big way for organic growers. Essentially what we do is we grow and produce fresh cooking oil. We deliver it to restaurants and they use it, but we also receive that waste oil back and we're able to sell that again to the farmers who use it as fuel. We are essentially selling the same product twice, but delivering two different values to do two different people. Everybody here has a legitimate stake in the management of the Whitefish Range. The wilderness advocates supported the increased timber harvest, and the timber advocates supported the increased wilderness area. Creative collaboration in northern Montana. Instead of duking it out, a wide coalition of residents work to protect this critical landscape. Thanks for watching, and remember, you can catch us anytime at thisamericanland.org. We'd like to hear your comments and ideas for stories that we should cover. We'll see you next time. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org. Funding for This American Land is provided by the Turner Foundation.